All right, this video is about the Federal Reserve System. Now, to kind of keep you up to date with where we're at in comparison to the book, the last time we had notes, we took some notes on the money multiplier, which is technically module 25. You will notice that I'm not giving you any notes over module 26. The reason being is it's fairly straightforward, and if you read module 26, um, it was more of like a history lesson, um, which is really good for the standpoint of actually understanding why our financial system is set up the way it is and some of the evolution of it and some of the problems with it over time even more recently. Um, but if you have any questions about that, you can come see me. Otherwise, um, module 27 is dealing with the Federal Reserve System. Now, the structure of the Federal Reserve, I actually have a couple of video clips in here that um, talk about the structure of the Fed. Uh, if I have time in class, I'll show them. If not, I'll skip them. Um, again, the Federal Reserve is basically made up of 12 member banks. Uh, you can see kind of in this little video um picture uh, the different uh, districts within the Federal Reserve Banking System and so you can see where we are. Um, we are in the seventh district um, so it gives you kind of an idea. Um, the way it's structured is basically that uh, the Board of Governors is um, chosen by the President and uh, they are going to be approved by the Senate and they serve 14 terms. Uh, the current uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve is Jerome Powell, as I talk about this. Um, and uh, yeah, so not a ton that we need to know about the structure, but let's talk about what uh, the functions of the Fed are. So first of all, the what does the Fed actually do? So the Federal Reserve is what we call a banker's bank. Um, they are the ones that kind of serve as the bank for commercial banks. So for yours, my, yours and my bank, that's where commercial banks go to put their savings. I use air quotes for that. Uh, so it's kind of like that's where they, they put their savings. That's what they call their reserves. Um, commercial banks actually go there to get loans. They clear checks, meaning like, you know, you write a check to your friend who deposits in their bank. The Federal Reserve is the one that's actually moving the money around and all that fun stuff. So that's what I mean by a banker's bank. So for example, we are part of the Chicago Fed in the seventh district. So any local banks like PNC, Chase, Fifth Third, those are all member banks of the Chicago Fed. Um, and so they will place some of their reserves with the Chicago Fed. They can get loans from the Chicago Fed, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, the Fed also is the bank of the U.S. government. Um, so Congress and uh, when they, you know, pass laws about, you know, collecting money and, you know, spending money, it goes through the Federal Reserve and it's through the Federal Reserve system. So it's not any one bank. So it's not like the Chicago Fed, um, but it is the bank of the U.S. government. Um, the Fed also inspects and regulates banks, so they make sure, for example, that banks are following the reserve requirement, um, you know, making sure they're making good deals, that kind of a thing. Um, the funny part about that being is, is that it says, and then we told them we'd self-regulate, ha ha ha. Here's the thing, is, is a lot of the people that are um, on the board of governors for each individual member bank are oftentimes coming from these commercial banks. So it's kind of funny because, you know, they oftentimes end up coming from, you know, like Chase Bank. And then it's like, oh, you know, I know some buddies over at Chase Bank. I might give them a deal, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, the Fed also provides stability to the system through providing liquidity to banks. What that means is, is remember, liquidity is cash. Okay, so they are going to provide stability when banks get in trouble. Remember we talked about getting loans out to commercial banks. Um, so uh, the Federal Reserve will do that. Um, and so they will uh, make access to loans for those commercial banks. And then lastly, the most important part of the Federal Reserve is, is that they conduct monetary policy. So uh, monetary policy is what is used to address the problems in the economy. And what you will find is, is that we will use this to address the problems of unemployment or inflation. Uh, if you remember way back to our last unit, when we talked about aggregate demand, and we talked about aggregate demand is influenced by monetary policy, this is where it is. So... 
Uh, monetary policy, remember when we talked about with aggregate demand, we said that it's basically the money supply. Um, I like this cartoon because it, it kind of gives a nice visual for really what the Fed does. Um, so the Fed basically controls the amount of money available. So if you think of it as this giant hose pipe, uh, this cartoon says, and this is where we adjust the interest rate. Uh, really, it's it's kind of what it does is that it, it, when they want to adjust the interest rates, either they go and open up the floodgate, so to speak, and open up the giant pipe and let the money flee, free flow through there, or they close it up and they're going to make it smaller and there's going to be a lot less money coming out. Um, so either way, um, that's definitely going to influence the interest rate. And we'll talk more about how that does that in a little bit. Um, and then uh, the monetary policy will also impact the federal funds rate. Okay, the federal funds rate is one that gets confused by a lot of people because it sounds counterintuitive to what it actually is. So the federal funds rate is the interest rate that banks charge each other on loans. So that will be the influenced by the discount rate. So it says this will impact the federal funds rate through the discount rate. So the federal funds rate is the uh, interest rate charged by banks. So if you think about it this way is, is that, for example, it's this way, okay? It's lateral movement. So, for example, if PNC has a whole bunch of excess reserves that's just sitting around they're not using, and Chase would like to go and they, they don't have a whole lot of excess reserves and they would like to borrow some money, they may do it where they borrow from, the, from PNC rather than borrowing them from the Fed. Why? Well, it's kind of a little, you know, PR problem here is as that, you know, it looks a little bit not so great if you're borrowing from the Fed constantly. Um, you know, that gets reported and out there in the public and people are like, well, what's wrong with you, Chase Bank? Um, not actually what happens. Um, but so the federal funds rate is going lateral movement. So the federal funds rate is what they charge each other interest on the loans to each other. Hey, buddy, why don't you give me a loan? Okay. Discount rate is what they charge from the Fed. So this direction, federal funds rate this way, discount rate this way. Okay, I'm making it that very obvious because I've had lots of people get that confused. Okay, here's what I want you to do now is, is that I would like you to go flip to your graphing section of your binder. Uh, and you're going to add this chart. So uh, just like all the other charts that we've had before, uh, you are going to have, uh, this is going to be about monetary policy tools. So in other words, what I'm talking about here is how does the Fed change the money, the amount of money out there? So if you remember in that, that picture that I just showed you where it was kind of opening or closing um, the, the hose pipe, so to speak, of the amount of money out there. How do they do that? Well, they have three tools in their uh, tool belt, if you go with that analogy. Uh, they have three tools in their tool belt, the reserve requirement, the discount rate, and open market operations. So here's what I want you to do. It says you're going to label this monetary policy tools, leave a room for a graph that will be added later, and then in the explanation part, just like as per usual, you're going to explain what the heck is the reserve requirement, what the heck is the discount rate. Those two are going to be pretty easy because we've, we've talked about them already. Open market operations, not so much. So you're going to have to read in your book, take a look at the explanation. And then you're going to look at uh, expansionary. So expansionary monetary policy, what would increase the money supply? What would I have to do to the reserve requirement to increase the money supply? Contractionary monetary policy, what would I have to do to decrease the money supply? What would I have to do to the reserve requirement to do that? So what I'd like you to do right now is pause the video, read those sections, those three sections on 263 and 264, and then come back. Okay. Hopefully, you took a look at uh, these three different monetary policy tools. So the reserve requirement, keep in mind the reserve requirement, remember we talked about, is uh, the amount of money that banks are required to keep that they cannot lend out. So how do you increase the money supply uh, with the reserve requirement? You're going to decrease the reserve requirement. Okay, well, how does that increase the money supply? Well, if you decrease the reserve requirement, that means that the banks don't have to keep as much money in hand in required reserves. That means they have less, they have more in excess reserves, which means they can make more loans, which increases the money supply. 
So then contractionary is going to be the exact opposite. If you go and increase the reserve requirement, then you are going to mean that they have to keep more of their reserves. They don't have as much to, as excess, so therefore they can't make as many loans. Okay, discount rate. Discount rate is going to be where this is the interest rate that the Fed charges on their loans. The interest rate the Fed charges on their loans. So expansionary monetary policy, uh, an increase in the money supply would be when the discount rate is lowered. If the discount rate is lowered, that means it's cheaper to get a loan from the Fed. So more banks will do that, and as a result, uh, they will make more loans to the general public. Then we have contractionary. So contractionary, I'm going to increase the discount rate. So to increase the discount rate, that means it's more expensive to get a loan from the Fed. Fed so there's going to be less banks that are going to do that. And so as a result, they're going to have less in excess reserves, so they're going to make less loans, decreasing the money supply. Okay, the last one, and I'll be honest, I'll say right now, open market operations, that is your number one go-to option. The Federal Reserve uses open market operations more often than any of the other ones up there. You need to know open market operations very, very well. I can guarantee that will be on your test, on your quiz, on your AP exam, for sure. Okay, so what is open market operations? Open market operations is going to be the buying and selling of um, securities. They call it securities. Basically, it's buying and selling of mostly treasury bills or treasury bonds. They're going to be very short-term investments. Now, everybody asks, okay, what's a treasury bill? We've talked about bonds before, but what's a bill? Well, basically, the, the only difference is a treasury bill is a very short term loan to the U.S. Treasury. So short term loan to the U.S. Treasury, uh, meaning that if I'm buying a Treasury bill, I'm giving the U.S. Treasury some of my money and they're going to give it back to me in a short amount of time period. So are Treasury bills a good thing? Do I want to own one? Yes, they're a financial asset. Right? So just like we talked about stocks and bonds and mutual funds, those are all things that I want to own because they're going to give me money. Same thing with treasury bills. So open market op operations is going to be when the Fed buys or sells treasury bills, treasury bills, treasury bonds. Okay, so which one am I going to do to expand the money supply? Am I going to buy or sell treasury bills? And when I say I, I mean the Federal Reserve. All right, so expansionary monetary policy, we're going to have the Federal Reserve buy treasury bills. Okay, how does that expand the money supply? Well, if you're having the Federal Reserve buy treasury bills, it doesn't matter if they're buying from banks or if they're buying from the general public, what happens is, is that the Federal Reserve, in order to get the treasury bill, they have to give the bank or the general public money. I want your treasury bill, here's some money. Okay, well that means that there's more money out there in circulation. If the bank has more money, they can use all of that to go and make new loans. So buying treasury bills are gonna put more money in the hands of the bank to make loans or more money in the hands of the public to be able to just spend. Contractionary monetary policy is going to be when the Federal Reserve sells treasury bills. If they're selling treasury bills, in order for the bank or the general public to get a treasury bill, they have to give the Federal Reserve cash. That means that's less money in reserves for the bank and it's less money in the hands of the general public. So as a result, the money supply decreases. All right, hopefully that made sense. Hopefully you were you filled it out and you checked your own. Okay, uh, if you have any questions about it, please let me know.